Greetings, I'm Sarah Reske here to talk to you today about the Mesozoic evolution of the Northern Cordillera margin of Laurentia. I want to acknowledge my co-authors Terry Pavlis, Jeff Lamato, and Jeff Tropp, and the many Canadian and Alaskan colleagues that I've had discussions with that have helped shape my interpretations over the years. And this talk, uh, the Cordillera margin that I'm referring to is from Southern British Columbia into Alaska and the terrains highlighted in purple, green, and yellow that were juxtaposed against Laurentia here in blue. One view of the Northern Cordillera is based on the origin of these terrains. In that view, uh, we have a, a cluster here in green that we refer to as the peri Laurentian terrains. These all formed marginal to North America and rifted away in the Devonian. They ocean basin between them and Laurentia collapsed in the, by the early Mesozoic and remnants of that are shown in this, uh, this crosshatcher pattern here along the margin, along through this part of the margin. This is referred to as the Slide Mountain Ocean. There's another ocean basin with the horizontal hatcher patterns down through here that have fauna that are quite distinct from that formed in the Tethian realm. And this is referred to as the Cache Creek assemblage or Cache Creek terrain. Um, there's been quite a bit of work published on both of these ocean marine motion basins and their entrapment. Um, and it's been summarized recently by Jim Monger and Dan Gibson. So I won't uh, dwell on these anymore in this talk. Instead, I'll be talking about the primarily the Mesozoic history of the purple or Arctic Northeast Pacific realm. And the next two slides, I'll cover their, uh, some of their early history and how they came over into the Pacific world. Um, and then we'll move on into their Mesozoic history. So in this perspective presented by a series of papers by uh, Joanne Nelson, Maurice Copron, Steve Israel and others, starting back in sort of the mid 2000s, um, they, it's been modified and adapted by others, but the general view is the reason we refer to these as the Arctic realm is that they all started out, at least in the Silurian, were clustered in this area between Siberia, Baltica, northern Laurentia, but by late Devonian Mississippian, at least some of the fragments are scattering uh, out into the Panthalassa realm, others are getting left behind along the Arctic margin. So in Arctic Alaska, I'll refer to later in the talk, uh, is, is trailing and instead Rangeli Alexander is escaping and has an active margin along it. And peri Laurentian terrains drifted away, as I mentioned earlier, and never went that far potentially from Laurentia. This distance is unknown, however. By early Jurassic times, there's uh, beginning to see hints that there were connections already between some of our Arctic realm terrains and peri Laurentian terrains based on their faunal assemblage. In this view, suggested that perhaps there was a continuous subduction zone between them. I think that's maybe uh, a bit contentious, but there's certainly evidence that there was a similar ocean basin that was subducting beneath them at this time. Uh, the peri Laurentian terrains are starting to collapse closer to the margin is the interpretation, and they certainly have an affinity, both of them with Yukon Tanana here, which was the original basement uh, associated with Laurentia. And then in the Canadian view, by middle Jurassic time, all of these trains have collapsed against the margin, so we no longer have marginal basins between the Pacific world and Laurentia. As we go north into Alaska, uh, we find the Mesozoic elements are quite different from Canada during this time. In particular, much of today's landmass out here in Western and Southwest Alaska is underlain by Mesozoic arcs and their marine basins. Uh, as far as we can tell, the only Paleozoic Proterozoic basement is preserved down here in Southwest Alaska. So with this view then, uh, we're left with the question of how and when did these marine basins close with respect to the Arctic realm and with the peri Laurentian Laurentian world here. So the polarities of subductions and the timing of these closures are what I will spend the rest of this talk on. The sources for my interpretations come in part from uh, recent compilations of geologic map of Alaska, where 
the uh, there's a, a large pamphlet that has a lot of great references and also based on the research of myself and my co-authors over many decades, we've covered the state fairly well in the south, uh, moderately well along the collisional margin up here and very poorly in this part of Alaska and this part of the Alaska, which is generally poorly known because in part uh, bad exposure, but also it's very difficult to get to. Um, we also have a terrific magnetic anomaly map compilation, which has also been interpreted and uh, highlighted here by Rick Saltis. And in this figure, you can see the northern margin of Alaska outlined here. Here's our boundary between Alaska and Canada. And each of these grid marks here is one, one to 250,000 quad degree quads, minute quads. So we have, you can see a very large area covered in Alaska with these quadrangles. Uh, the, some of the anomalies here are helpful for interpreting arc terrains, particularly some of these red colors are affiliated with known arc terrains and we can trace them then much further than we might see them at the surface. And the truncation of them, particularly right here, you can see coincides with known faults at the surface that we can continue to trace where they get covered by uh, later deposits. So this reference overlaid on top of the geologic map provides a lot of the controls on where I, I put boundaries for faults and terrains. So getting back to this question of how and when did these ocean basins close? I use the blue schist and eclogite locales as our, what I think are best resources for that question. Um, in particular, we have extensive blue schist along the margin here in Southern Alaska and in Northern Alaska. There's one other known Mesozoic blue schist locale here in Southwest Alaska. Uh, we know very little about it. The age is broadly constrained to be uh, crystallization during the mid Triassic to early Jurassic. It's part of the good news terrain and I won't be saying anything more about it today. So instead I'll start here with Southern Alaska. These blue schists are forming along the backstop against an arc, uh, early Triassic, late Triassic, early Jurassic arc, the Talkeetna. And they are, each of these squares represents an area where we have a fair amount of research done. Um, they have a broadly similar crystallization age of early Jurassic. They're not very continuous across strike, but quite a bit laterally along strike. So they're coherent terrains. There's younger blue schist locale over here, um, not well dated. It's constrained to be early Cretaceous. So these are all part of the oldest margin of the Cretaceous, of the Chugach accretionary complex. Well, we uh, presented a paper just a year ago in GSA Today, myself, um, my co-authors, and George Garrels and Ken, Ken Ridgeway, uh, where we basically summarized evidence from both Canadian and the Alaskan perspective on the subduction polarity of these ancient arcs. And in this uh, end member, two end member views we show here, which I've re uh, re redrawn a bit from the published article, uh, we have two parallel subduction zones in the earliest Cretaceous shown here in red. These subductions under both the insular terrain and the peri Laurentian terrains were closing a basin in between them, um, shown here with different colors because they do have different. Um, ages and sources on either side of that basin, as opposed to the view from Canada again, because they see very good evidence that the basin closed in the middle Jurassic, so they then have it just rifting slightly to open a back arc basin by the early Cretaceous. There is a uh, distinct history in Alaska that is separate from Canada and that we never saw closure or collision of a basin before the mid-Cretaceous. And both areas do show uh, convergence in the mid-Cretaceous, so that's the common theme. And we, our co-authors and I, myself, we thought that this, essentially we will eventually come to an agreement that they are, have a similar history. So then we're gonna move now into the Arctic realm and I should back up to point out where I'm going to. Here's our transform boundary that's truncating this, this Laurentian margin story. And in the Arctic, we have a polarity of subduction that's the opposite from what we see in the Laurentian realm down here. So I put a transform through here to accommodate that difference and that's what I'll spend the rest of the talk about. 
up in this area, the, the blue schists here are very uh, continuous, over hundreds of kilometers. They're also distinct from elsewhere that I've been referring to so far in that they are formed on continental margin material. And so this, this margin is being subducted underneath an oceanic island arc. Um, the polarity of subduction is fairly well established, but the, the timing is not. There's uh, ages of 170 in the west, 145 down here in the ruby terrain and in eastern Alaska, and also as young as 120 in a structurally lower package of lower grade blue schists in, south, in northwest Brooks Range, this area again. So this is either a longly uh, continuous collisional record or some so subduction to collision along the margin, or there is potentially spatially uh, distinct areas subducting at different times. It's clear we need more dates from this area. In any event, by about 140 to 130 million years, there's general consensus that we've evolved from subduction to collision. This is seen part based on the ages of the blue schist being thrust under the fore arc of the arc. Here shown the Koyukuk arc. And in addition, the chemistry of the arc shows that we now have an influx of continental material into uh, what was a formerly an ocean island arc assemblage. And this model I also show a dextral transfer or strike slip fault here that intersects that collisional system and that's perhaps forming as a way for part of the margin to escape away from the points of collision. Now the perspective I have here of this, this block view is a, basically a line about right through here and a relatively new interpretation that I have um, been working on with Allison Till on, on this truncation of our Blucius belt here is that it was formed as a sinistral transform in the Cretaceous that uh, allows us to have a, an explanation for why we have an abrupt end of the blue schists. And this may have also coincided with the development of this dextral strike slip fault. So I'm gonna pursue that idea a bit further here in the last bit of the talk. Um, this idea is, is not unique. It's been actually around for quite a long time that there was a sinistral transform that may have been associated with opening of the uh, Arctic Ocean in particular, this part of it, which is called the Canada Basin. Uh, the most recent interpretation of this sinistral transform model, if you will, is by a paper by uh, Dossing and others. And this figure from their paper shows that they interpret the onset of seafloor spreading here to be affiliated with a sinistral transform boundary on either side, uh, with here's Northern Alaska and Siberia. And this was a very oblique and short-lived rifting. And that would be one explanation again for forming potentially a transform boundary. So let's explore this transform model a little bit further. Um, in the, so here and now I have a different map view. I'm showing here the same continental margin terrains. Here the arcs I've split into two categories, a late Jurassic, early Cretaceous, and then a Permian, early Cretaceous. And in this view, this, this transform potentially can be traced all the way to Southwest Alaska. And it's separating trains that underwent that Arctic origin collisional model that I just presented from those that did not see that event at all. In particular across the Farewell uh, Ruby terrain boundary through here, there's no shared history until the late Cretaceous. So this alone indicates that we have to have some major um, faults in between them and I would propose that they started out as sinistral transforms and then were truncated and offset by, so we go uh, by dextral uh, faults in the Cretaceous and early tertiary. So the, as I said, this is, this is quite speculative, but I think it does give us a way to think about how all of this realm, which has such a different history from the north part of Laurentia here, uh, may have become juxtaposed. That does leave us with some very major questions, in particular, how was farewell terrain, which is part of our Arctic realm terrains to begin with, became part of North America. This is known to have mid-Cretaceous shortening, but beyond that, we don't know when and how they were juxtaposed. And the relationship of the farewell with island arc terrains down here, including the Toyak, is also not well established. So in sum, I'll just uh, line up the questions that I addressed earlier in this talk and pretty much a descending order of how well we understand some of the geologic relationships between them from moderately well-known to quite poorly known. And you can see we still have quite a long ways to go before we 
can assemble the Mesozoic part of the Northern Cordillera. Thank you.